Okay, we're picking up now with um, Unit 3, according to the state's curriculum, which is not necessarily the same thing that's in your textbook. But we're going by the review notes, and the review notes that are here are keyed to what the state's um, division is in different sections of the, of the course. So we're picking up with expansion, nationalism, and sectionalism. Excuse me, this is going to take us, as you can see, pull this over here, <clears throat> from 1800 till 1865. So, as you can see, that's taking us right up through the Civil War. And so, it's the whole first half of the 1800s. Big things to notice at this time, broadly speaking, is expansion of the United States of America the idea of manifest destiny, the crisis over slavery, and the changes that are happening as a result of um, technology, um, mostly transportation, being able to move things around quickly, which opens up markets. It means that new areas of the country can be open to producing uh, crops and then selling them to the rest of the world and can be receiving imports. <clears throat> so we begin first in this section with the expansion of the United States. So by this time the United States is now um, in place, but we have the Louisiana Purchase here as the biggest event that takes place with respect to this um, expansion in this time period. So let's just uh, uh, think for a moment about that, if I can pull this over here. Okay, let me open this up just a moment. Oops. I'm going to move this. Here we go. And pull this down just a bit. There we go. So, 1803 this is now. Thomas Jefferson is President of the United States at this point, our third President. We've had the first president, Washington, who has gotten the country rolling and has urged the United States to stay out of the affairs of Europe, um, not so much to isolate ourselves, but not to play favorites, not to take sides, to avoid permanent alliances. The United States by this time is this um, sort of peachy colored area. I can, there we go, um, sort of orangey, peachy kind of color. Those are now the United States, the original 13 colonies, and now we've added Kentucky and St. Louis and Ohio. The old Northwest Territory that we should remember is this, the blue area up here. Ohio's a state, the rest of it is still territory and has not been settled, and Ohio is just beginning to be settled. Uh, the Spanish still control Florida. That's not part of the United States yet. The whole of the Southwest is controlled by Spain. And we get this Louisiana Purchase. So what happens with the Louisiana Purchase? The Mississippi River is the key thing to remember about the Louisiana Purchase. The purpose of it was to control this river. So if we look at, um, pull this up a bit, the river system here, you've got the Ohio River. The state of Ohio was here. Kentucky is below it. Beautiful farmland there. The problem is the Appalachian Mountains run up and down here. That's a problem. You can't get over them. Well, you can, but it's a big pain in the neck. So there's no real way to get from uh, here, if you're a farmer on this rich land, out to New York or uh, Philadelphia or Baltimore to ship the grain you're growing to sell it to the rest of the world. The one way to do it was down the Ohio River. And that's pretty easy. Rivers are the highways of the time. And you go down the Mississippi then, out New Orleans, which is down here, to the rest of the world. The problem is the United States only owns one side of the river. 
it doesn't control the river. And if you notice down here, that's all owned still by France. New Orleans is the port city. And if you control New Orleans, you control sort of the faucet for this whole river. Thomas Jefferson sends over a bunch of ambassadors to France to offer to pay a kind of toll to use New Orleans. He wants to make a deal so that the farmers can use the Mississippi to ship to the rest of the world, and he's willing to, to um, pay a kind of fee or a percentage to make that happen. So they go over there expecting to be able to negotiate this kind of a deal. Well, the French have a problem. French are ruled at this point by Napoleon. Napoleon is way short of cash. And France owned a little island down here, part of an island, called Haiti. Haiti was a big moneymaker for France because um, it was a sugar plantation. We've talked about that a whole bunch of times, how important that was. There had recently been a revolution in Haiti. And the attitude of the French was, we can't control Haiti down here. What's the point of owning New Orleans? They weren't doing anything really with any of this. So Napoleon offers, instead of paying a fee for, you know, using the, the port here, we'll sell you the whole Louisiana territory. And so, the ambassadors can't pass up a deal, and they buy the Louisiana Territory for $15 million. Now, $15 million was, you know, in one way, a large amount of money. In another way, it's, you know, you're, you're comparing what is that really worth? What could you buy with that? What can you buy with that today? The equivalent amount of money today would buy approximately, and I figured it out once, approximately the Oakwood neighborhood. That's it. It would buy one um, maybe square mile or so of, of houses in the neighborhood of our school. Here, you're getting 828,000 square miles. You're doubling the land mass of the country in one swoop. It is enormous. So, for $15 million, who could beat that deal? Jefferson can't pass it up. Doubles the size of the country. And then the next question is, what have we just bought? Nobody knows what the hell is out here. So Jefferson sends out the Lewis and Clark expedition. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, who are um, two uh, officers, military officers, who uh, are trained in map making, in uh, surveying, and uh, really kind of scientific, um, amateur scientific observers. What does Jefferson want to know? He wants to know not just what's the lay of the land out here. We have no idea what is out here. He also wants to know what could we grow there? What's the soil like? What kind of native plants are out there? What kind of animals are out there? He wants some reconnaissance on the Native Americans. Tell me about the Indians that are out there. Are they friendly? Are they willing to make deals? What are they like? And, very important, you notice the Mississippi comes up here. We know it connects the Ohio. We had vague ideas about how far the Mississippi went up. We don't really know. We uh, want to know this Missouri River that branches off. There's a guess, maybe, it would take us all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. As we've talked about before, there is this drive from the time of Columbus 
to get to China, to, to, to make contact and do the trade with Asia. They're still looking to do that. Columbus came over, that's what he was looking for. The explorers after him were looking for the Northwest Passage around um, the Americas. We're looking for a way through the South uh, of uh, Central America and South America. We're still looking for a way to get to China. So if we can find a water route, a river that takes us all the way out to the Pacific coast, that would be great. And so off Lewis and Clark go, and they spend a couple of years um, making this expedition, and you can see the line there. They follow the river. They get up around here. This is not really important. They won't ask on the regions, but they split into two uh, groups because they realize there's a fork in the river. So one group follows the Yellowstone and the other group follows the Missouri. They meet black up, back up. Here, of course, is the uh, running up and down here are the Rocky Mountains. So they discover the Rocky Mountains are all there in the way. But they find out that right on the other side of the Rockies is the Columbia River. That gets them all the way out to the Pacific. Notice something, by the way. The green here is the Louisiana Territory. The green. The gray is not. The gray is still claimed by Britain. But that doesn't stop Lewis and Clark from going around and checking the joint out. And so um, they make it all the way back uh, to Washington, report back to um, uh, Jefferson couple of uh, points here. They, along the way, run into Sacagawea. Now, we should m make mention here because there's a lot of mythology and storytelling that goes on around her, that she was the great guide who showed them the way, that she was the most important person on the expedition. Um, and, oops, nope, I don't need that. Where is it? There we go. And that she died uh, in 1884, 80 years after making that, that trip. Well, none of that is exactly true. First of all, this monument does exist out there in a pl place where people would like to believe she died. In fact, it is more likely she died at this monument in about 1814 or so. We don't have a lot of information about Sacagawea. She may show up on the Regents' exam. We know she was a Native American woman. We know that she was the wife, question mark, of a French fur trader. Um, how much freedom she had in that and how much she was kind of sold to him by her tribe, it seems like she may not have had a lot of say in it, to be perfectly honest with you. It is true that she accompanied her husband and the expedition. Her husband was hired as a, an interpreter. Um, he had been a, a, he was a Frenchman who was a fur trader. He had dealt with a lot of the Indians. So Meriwether Lewis and, and William Clark hired him to kind of help them try to communicate with any Indians they met. It is also true that, um, Sacagawea seems to have been even more helpful in that regard. She, um, knew several Indian languages. She appears to have had a sort of knack for them. And so she was a key helper in negotiating with some of the Indians that they met. Uh, this is a dollar coin that was made many years later, of course, just recently. And um, she's the, the first woman, real woman, I should say. Uh, that we have coins with Lady Liberty on them, but the first actual historical woman to appear on an American, uh, on a, any piece of American money, especially a coin. Uh, that's actually her son. Um, she had a son on the trail with them. Um, Jean Baptiste was the kid's name. And he did grow up to a ripe old age, and he became something of a bit of a celebrity in later years. Uh, she was sort of forgotten. We know very little about her life overall. Again, she seems to have died around 1812, 1814. 
but he lived on and and had a little bit of of uh, fame of his own. Okay, the Louisiana Purchase, of course. Let me, oh, uh, first of all, I, I should just point this out. Won't be on the exam, I'm sure, but. William Clark, July 25th, 1806. This exists, this bit of graffiti, uh, up here in Montana. That was found decades later. Also was found, uh, if I can find it, this. So Captain, this is backwards, Meriwether M. Lewis. This is a branding iron. So you, this, you would have heated this up, and then you would have been able to um, stamp it into leather goods that you had to mark it as yours, um, even perhaps, you know, on a tree stump or something. This was found many decades later uh, in Oregon, in the Oregon Territory. So we know for sure they made it all the way. Okay. Nobody, th later on, this will become states. It takes a long time for that to happen. But you see, by the time it does happen, you get all of these states out of it. Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, North, South Dakota, parts of Minnesota, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado. We make a deal with um, the British later. See this bit up here? We give that away to England. In return, we get this bit up here. So we kind of swap to even out the line here. So it is a huge addition to the country, but it's going to take decades before it makes much of a difference. Nobody is really uh, going out there yet. The other thing to note about this is the idea of manifest destiny. That is not a word that is being used in 1803 not being used in 1803. But you can already see the idea in the background. Jefferson thinks it's a good idea for us to take this whole new section of the continent. We haven't even filled this in yet, as we saw. We're barely filling in Ohio. We haven't touched what's now Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin. And yet he's already thinking about taking this and is sending them out beyond that to go out to Oregon and Washington State and Idaho. So <clears throat> there's already in the back of people's heads the idea that maybe we should go from sea to sea, that maybe we are destined to do this. Okay. Well, Louisiana Purchase, very nice. What happens next? The next thing we've got to talk about is the War of 1812 sometimes called the Second War of American Independence. Why would it have been called that? Well, here's what's going on. If you remember, the British are raiding American shipping. The British and French at this time are at war with each other. And therefore believe that they have a right to steal um, anything that's going to help the other guy in war. So, we, as we have talked about in class, you had this thing called uh, privateers. Privateers were really nothing more than pirates, which was a business. Piracy was a business at the time. You stole a guy's ship and you got the stuff in the ship, which you could then resell. You got a ship which you could resell, or if it was better than your ship, you took that over and used that to get around in. And if he had any wealthy passengers, you held them for ransom. So private, and the difference between a pirate and a privateer was a pirate was simply an outlaw. A privateer was given a license by a country to do this on the promise that you would only go after your enemy's shipping. In other words, pirates went after everybody. They were just gangsters, and they had to, to hole up on islands in the Caribbean and hope not to get caught. A privateer would get a license from the King of England, 
And the deal was he could go after French ships to his heart's, heart's content. He just couldn't touch British ships. And the French handed out licenses to privateers too. So did the Americans. When the, the United States would get into wars, we would have privateers as well. And there was nothing considered terribly dishonorable about it. So the French and the British were raiding each other's ships, but also raiding ships of anybody who traded with their enemy. The French went after some American ships, but not nearly as many as the British did. The British went after American ships because we were continuing to trade with both sides in that war, both France and Britain. So, the United States raided by British ships, and here's the really tough thing. They impressed sailors. Now, impress here, again, you should remember from class, has a specific meaning. It means drafting the sailors. So they go on board a United States flag vessel, round up the sailors on board, and draft them into the British Navy. They got away with this, or they claimed to be able to get away with this, because they refused to recognize American citizenship. So their argument was, all of these sailors really were British citizens. There was no such thing as American citizenship, or at least they didn't have to honor it or recognize it, and so they could draft these guys into the Navy. As we recall from class, the life of a sailor was pretty miserable. And so the way the British kept their ships um, fully manned was drafting guys and some pretty horrible, harsh discipline. So the United States was being treated as a third-class country, and its sovereignty, that is, its right to govern itself, was being ignored. So the United States finally began to fight back. In 1812, after years of... Um, uh, this being ignored. And this is a problem that actually went back as far as Washington and Adams. But under um, uh, Madison, so you have Washington, Adams, Jefferson. Jefferson is followed by President James Madison, the guy who helped write the Constitution. Under Madison, it got so horrific, so awful, that the um, British that the Americans went to war with Britain. And so you got the War of 1812. So let's take a look at that for just a second here. Again, you're not going to have to remember all the battles or any of that sort of thing. A few things to notice about it. First of all, um, battles were partially at sea. Here you've got British ships that were set up to blockade American ports. Battles were also up in the territories up here. So Canada is British. They had never fully left the Northwest Territory. At the end of the American Revolution, the British Army was supposed to withdraw from everything that was east of the Mississippi in what's now the United States. The British had kept a handful of forts out in the Michigan Territory. And we never really had the power to do much about it. We, we ignored it because Michigan, there was nothing out there. It was just woods at the time. They, it was disrespectful to the United States to have your troops on our territory. But it was also not something we were ready to make a big deal about. Well, by 1812, we're ready to make a big deal about it. So up in the Great Lakes, up in Lake Erie, you had a, ser uh, a, a number of battles up here. You had the battle up here by F uh, Fort Detroit, which later becomes the city of Detroit. You have a few battles up in Lower Canada. And a lot of the War of 1812 was fought in upstate New York. So Fort Niagara, which is over by where Buffalo is now, and um, up in uh, Lake Champlain. Some of you may know uh, this area. SUNY Plattsburgh, which is way the hell up by the, the uh, Canadian border, 
um, that's one of the SUNY campuses up there. It's right on the border of Vermont, so you have Lake George up around here, and um, Lake Champlain is between New York and Vermont, right up there by the Canadian border. So you actually had invasion of the United States of America. It's the last time we were invaded on our own property. British troops marched down from Montreal to Plattsburgh, and you had a battle over here in uh, Detroit. So, um, the most famous incident, I guess, of the war was the burning of Washington, D.C. So down here in 1814, the British came into Chesapeake Bay, went after Baltimore, but also stopped off at Washington. Washington by then was the capital of the country, and Admiral Coburn, who was the commander of the British troops, and his men, stormed into the Capitol building itself, where Congress meets. They stormed into the House of Representatives chamber, so the, the room where the House meets, and Admiral Coburn stood on the chair where the Speaker of the House presides and rallied his men as they set fire to the building. This is all an absolutely uh, true story here. So, if we uh, take a look for a minute, um, President James Madison had to escape out of um, Washington one step ahead of the uh, British. Um, they, uh, his wife, Dolly Madison, saved a portrait of um, Washington. So, if I can pull it up here, which I'm having trouble pulling up for you. Hang on. Okay, so this is what I was looking for. This is the Capitol building. Now, the Capitol building was only partially completed. Um, the This is the War of 1812, remember? 1814 is when most of the action took place. The Capitol doesn't get finished until uh, the middle of the Civil War, so the 1860s. So it was a slow, slow process to build it. This was the part that was built by then, and you can see the scorch marks all around it. The whole interior of what had been built already was burned. Nearby, the White House, this is the White House, was also burned. You can see it's gutted, and um, the um, uh, scorch marks all around it here. Um, Madison and his wife had to flee to save their lives. Famously, if I can get this to work, uh, Dolly Madison, uh, his wife, as they are rushing out of the building a step ahead of the British troops, saved this. Uh, this is Gilbert Stewart's portrait of George Washington. And it was um, done from life. Washington actually sat for it or stood for it. Um, remember, they didn't have photographs in the day. So Madison, uh, Dolly Madison, is, wanted to be sure that future generations would know this man and know who he was. And at that moment, they thought maybe the whole country is going to be lost forever. So, you know, the one record they had for sure of Washington's face she wanted to save. So it's not as crazy as it sounds. Uh, the British only went in and destroyed the town and then withdrew right away. In the meantime, they went after the city of Baltimore. And this is Baltimore Harbor, a part of Baltimore Harbor. And this here is Fort McHenry. So when they go after Fort McHenry, they go after it with, um, explosive shells. They're not going to ask you this specifically on the Recon exam, but just trust me for a moment. They go after it with explosive shells. Um, they go after it with what are called Congreve rockets, which look like sort of cartoon um, uh, fireworks. You know, the, the big red 
rocket on the stick kind of thing, uh, which were a, a modern version. At that time, it was state-of-the-art weaponry. A lawyer, an American lawyer, who was in Baltimore Harbor watching the bombardment of Fort McHenry, spent all night on one of the ships in the harbor watching this. And it's pitch dark, of course. There's no artificial light in those days. So in the morning, as it started to dawn, he wrote down a poem that he composed on the, spite, on the spot. And the poem is a question. He's turning to a friend and he says, Oh, say, can you see, by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed, that thing, he's saying, that we saw at the twilight at sundown's last gleaming. And he's talking about the flag. And if you know the national anthem, that poem is later set to music. It's actually set to a British drinking song. Uh, that's the tune. And that becomes the Star Spangled Banner. Now, who cares about any of this? Well, it's a big thing for the United States. At the end of the war, the United States does not exactly win. We don't get anything at the end of that war that we didn't have before it. But the British also don't win. They are forced to recognize the United States as a legitimate country, and they leave the territory that they shouldn't have been in in the first place. And by that time, Napoleon's been defeated. So they don't care about the shipping anymore. They leave American ships alone. So this is why it's called the Second War of Independence. We assert our legitimacy as a country. We may have been independent by, you know, the American Revolution, but were we going to be taken seriously? And because at the end of that war, it ends in a draw, right? But the United States didn't lose. And we should put that in. It is therefore a big win for the U.S. The Star Spangled Banner comes out of this war along with a burst of enthusiastic national pride, a feeling of power, and a new national kind of self-confidence. <coughs> What also happens is the Federalist Party loses. They had opposed the war, even talked about breaking away from the U.S., and were now seen as traitors. The Democrat Republicans <coughs> are the winners, and a new party, the Whigs, will emerge. Okay, in this burst of confidence, let's talk about the Monroe Doctrine. So about 10 years later now, you have President James Monroe. So what's going on with James Monroe? Whoops, let's hang on. So Monroe comes along, he's president in 1823. By that time, you've had a bunch of revolutions in Central and South America. So this was the situation. Brazil had been owned by the Portuguese. Spain had owned all of South America, Central America, and most of the Caribbean. The British and the French had a little bit here and there. That's British Honduras. Um, 
the the Dutch actually had owned a piece of property down here. So you had a few other countries that had bits and pieces, but basically it's all Portuguese and Spanish. Early 1800s, um, 1820s in particular, you had a rash of independence movements in Latin America. You see here the dates. In 1822, Brazil had declared its independence from Portugal. In 1811, Uruguay and Paraguay had gone. Argentina in 1816. Chile in 1818. Um, Mexico in 1821. And the rest of these countries, Ecuador in 1822, Bolivia is going to go in 1825. Peru is going to go in 1824. Central America, um, which is a, a Nicaragua and what is today part of uh, Panama and um, like that down here, that's going to go in 1823. So you see a bunch of these countries, big Mexico, Brazil, and uh, the, uh, the southern tip, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, had already gone by 1823. The rest of these countries, Central America um, and uh, Bolivia and Peru, are about to go. They're in the process of going. They're getting their independence. That's the context in which Monroe says, Remember, the Western Hemisphere is now closed to new colonization, and the U.S. will act as the big brother to these newly free democracies and republics in Latin America. We will protect them from recolonization by Europe. Monroe makes the point, we have no interest in interfering in European affairs or taking over colonies, but Europe should stay out of affairs in the Americas, meaning Central and South America. The Monroe Doctrine, remember it as Western Hemisphere is closed to new colonization and the U.S. will act as the protector of these newly freed countries from Europe. The truth is, we probably did not have the power to back up that boast. Our army wasn't big enough, our navy wasn't big enough, Europe knew that. But it does show both our pride and a sense of self-confidence and our sense that we were meant to be the main power in this hemisphere. Again, uh, manifest destiny is not being used yet, but it is certainly an idea in the background of what's going on here. Okay. Okay, next let's talk briefly about the market revolution, as it's called, and some of the changes in American life that are the result of that. Sounds boring, but you've got to know um, the pieces. They make it, they make the rest of the history of the period uh, really work. So, first of all, market revolution. What does that mean? Prior to this time, you had to buy what you could obtain locally. Your food was locally grown. The grain and wheat and stuff was locally produced. Um, if you wanted a tool or furniture or something, you had to have a local craftsman, uh, maybe guys from the next town over. The market revolution is about opening up where you can sell your stuff and from where you can buy. So farmers, let's say out in that Ohio River Valley, Instead of just selling locally, or maybe to the next town over, 
or maybe you know moving it down the Mississippi more easily in this time in market revolution can sell their grain to the big cities of the East Coast and even Europe and if you're living on the farm in Ohio you can import your furniture or your tools or the latest gadgets as far as from Europe what makes this possible first and foremost is transportation so let's talk about that for a minute okay the first big thing is the Erie Canal so the Erie Canal um, is uh, a, a revolu a, a engineering revolution as well as a, um, a, a transportation revolution Call the Erie Canal because it connects you with Lake Erie and takes you across New York State to here, which is the Hudson River. The Hudson River, a, a canal, right, if we think about it, what is it? It's really just a an artificial river that you're building. So the Erie Canal is meant to connect the Great Lakes with New York City. The Hudson is already there, so now you've got to connect the Great Lakes to the area around Albany or Troy, New York. Some of you may know Rensselaer Polytech, that's up in Troy, SUNY Albany, which is Albany's right across the river there from Troy. So you have to get it across, but there's no river that does that. So what you have to do is build a canal. You dig a ditch from um, Lake Erie all the way over here which is itself a giant engineering feat. I'll show you, uh, if I can pull this down a bit, this is what you have to accomplish. So this is the level, water level, of Lake Erie. Upstate New York is mountainous. This is the water level down here, if you can see, of Albany. So you've got to take a ship um, a, a barge, really, a small boat, from here to here, you're not going to be able to dig a ditch that deep all the way down, nor do you want to have, like, wild rapids running. So you've got to dig a series of ditches and then connect them using locks. So this is a lock. This is the river. Boat comes in this end. This door then closes. This is a watertight door. You flood this kind of bathtub area to raise the level of the ships, and then you sail it out this end now that it's at the new level that you need. This is another of the locks, and it shows you, right? So the water level on the other side of this system is up this high. You sail the ship in here. Doors are all closed. You pump the water out. It drops down. You open the doors, and it sails out. This is a spillway that, that moves the water in a controlled fashion as you're pumping it in and out. What this does is it allows you to move your boats efficiently from here to here through that ditch system it's, it's about 40 feet wide, and in some places it's only about 10 feet deep. Because all you need is enough to be able to float the, the barge and overcome friction. And move your stuff. You've got complicated locks here, because upstate New York is very mountainous. And get you all the way to Albany, and then you can sail it down the Hudson to New York City. Okay, well, that's nice. What does that really do for anybody? So, let's realize what you're connecting. This is the Erie Canal, this line up here. We'll talk about the rest in a minute. It takes you from Lake Erie, Buffalo, to Albany, then down the Hudson to New York. But if you can get to Lake Erie, that's all these guys in Ohio, and part of Michigan, and western Pennsylvania. Running this way through here are the um, Appalachian Mountains. 
So what this gives you is, instead of putting your stuff in Ohio on the Ohio River, all the way down the river, all the way down the Mississippi, you can put it on Lake Erie, take it on this um, uh, canal, and ship it out of New York. Okay, well, time is money. This may be a little fuzzy to read, I hope not. From New York City to Buffalo, just that, that part of the canal. Right, if you were, if you were a farmer out here, and you wanted to get your stuff to New York City to ship it out, before the canal, it would take you fifty days, month and a half, and cost you a hundred dollars a ton to do it. After the canal, it takes you a week, and costs you at most a third of that, and really often a lot less. You can see what this does, by the way, to the local economy, right? New York City goes from being an important port to being the most important port in the country because it is the way to get out to the whole Midwest area. It also means up along the canal in upstate New York, you're going to have businesses arise. All of those businesses are going to want to set up shop along the canal because they can get raw materials in, and put raw materials, uh, put the manufactured goods back out again to ship it from New York to the whole rest of the world. So you look at the city of Rochester. Rochester is up here. Rochester before the canal was all of about 1,500 people, twice the size of Farrell. As soon as the canal is built in the 1820s, it opens in 1825, it's 36,000 people. Buffalo goes from 2,000, again, about twice the size of Farrell, to almost 50,000. And New York City goes up by five times, almost. It goes from being an important town to being the important town in America. So you see the big effect this has just on New York and on the country. Once the Erie Canal was built in 1825, a bunch of others start to be built as well. So this canal, the Ohio and Erie Canal, connects the Ohio River to Lake Erie. So if you were in Kentucky, Indiana, parts of Virginia now, you were a farmer, even Illinois, you're a farmer, you can hop your stuff on the river, take it up the canal, and instead of going all the way down through New Orleans or trying to, to yank it over the um, Appalachian Mountains, you just go the water route out New York City, and suddenly your world is, is a possibility for you. This is another map of the networks of canals that start to spring up to connect into each other. The canal era is going to last until it starts to be replaced by the railroads. And most of the railroads actually follow, at least originally, the lines of the canal. So the New York Central Railroad, which is one of the two biggest in the country in the, the age of railroads around the Civil War and after that, goes up to Hudson and follows along next to the canal out to eventually uh, Chicago. The Pennsylvania Railroad, the other its big competitor to the New York Central, goes from New York City and follows the canals, the so-called main line, out as well eventually to Chicago. Okay, so the canals don't underestimate. The steamboat. Robert Fulton, we know, invents the steamboat, figures out how to make a steam engine work and make it practical on a boat. Why is that important? It's not just, don't just focus on the fact that it makes the steamboat quicker. It makes it more predictable. Boats could move pretty quickly on a river as long as they were going down river. Now it can go upriver just as easily. You can go across the Atlantic. Well, they had sailboats that could go across the Atlantic. That wasn't, you know, terribly difficult. But it took a long time, and you never knew. It based on the weather. It could take anywhere from uh, a month um, to three months, or two and a half months, to get across the Atlantic, depending on the weather. With a steamboat, because it's going at a pretty steady pace, 
all ships are going to be somewhat influenced by the weather, but you could pretty reliably do it in a couple of weeks, two to three, depending on, you know, conditions. That's a much more efficient system. Other technology of the time that's part of this market revolution thing, the cotton gin. We talked about the cotton gin before. You really better know it. The cotton gin makes cotton profitable. Prior to the cotton gin, it would take a slave all day to fill one of the sort of standard bags of cotton, and it would take a second slave an entire day to process that cotton, picking the seeds out of it and tearing the, the cotton into um, fiber. With the cotton gin, that bag of cotton, instead of taking nine hours to process, took a few minutes. Cotton suddenly becomes profitable, and the entire South goes from being tobacco to being cotton. Cotton also requires a lot of land. Uh, it depletes the land very quickly. So cotton plantation owners were always looking for more and better land, so they moved across the South from east to west in a pretty steady march scooping up more and more land and taking slavery with them because slavery is now re-energized. They become completely dependent on that slave uh, um, uh, labor. We should also point out the cotton gin's inventor, Eli Whitney, also invents interchangeable parts. So the idea that you take, for instance, a musket I have here, right? Prior to this, one craftsman who was a skilled maker of um, guns for hunting would craft an entire gun for you to order. Now you would one guy who would stand there and just make a thousand gun barrels and another guy who would make a thousand uh, gun stocks, the, the, the shoulder pieces that are made out of wood, and another guy that would make a thousand triggers. They're not skilled. They don't know how to put a whole gun together like a craftsman. They just know their one job of standing there working at a machine and making gun barrels. Therefore, they're easily replaced. You can swap out a worker uh, with a few minutes training and get them going to, you know, start making that one part. And then all you have to do is have a guy who assembles it together. That makes stuff much cheaper. So it's much more affordable, let's say, for people to buy a, a hunting musket. But it also means that people lose their relationship to their work. You can't go home and say, I made that, I spent a day making this piece of craftsmanship. No, you spent all day standing there at a machine, turning out thousands of the same pieces. And that's a kind of dehumanizing experience. It also means you have nothing to bargain with. If I run a gun factory, a skilled craftsman making guns took years to learn his whole trade. If all I have to do is find a new guy to make gun barrels, well, there's a line of 50 guys waiting there and I can train one of them. So I can pay them as little as I feel like, and if you don't like it, you're easily replaced. So the interchangeable parts has an upside. It gives people much cheaper... Um, uh, items, so much cheaper goods, makes it easier for them to afford it. But it also robs a lot of skilled craftsmen of, of what they had to bargain with and makes people almost like they're part of the factory instead of human beings working in a, in a job. With the cotton, uh, with cotton, um, yeah, uh, cultivation exploding, and new machines invented, I should put, right? Cloth mills become major factories throughout New England and upstate New York. So with the South producing now huge amounts of cotton, well, cotton's no good unless you turn it into something. So you have to take the cotton fiber and weave it into cloth, and you start to get machines driven by water power mostly at this time, and soon it will be steam power 
turning all that fiber into cloth, huge looms. Young women start to come off the farms and get jobs there. Young women. Women would go off and work in these, these mills long enough to sort of land a husband for themselves. But they had a few dollars in their pocket they made. It gave them a little bit of economic independence, even though it was not like we would think of it today. The, the um, mill girls were treated like they were schoolgirls. They lived in dorms that were heavily supervised. They had curfews. Um, their lives were pretty carefully monitored. <coughs> it was almost like living in a monastery. But they were paid, and they did have their own money. And it did get them off the farm and see, well, a different part of the world a little bit. People were born, lived, and died in their own little towns. Now maybe they might go a couple of towns over, or even a couple of states over, to get a job in one of these mills, at least until they settled down and had a family. So people's relationship to their work is beginning to change as well. Okay, that takes us through the 1820s. Uh, next video lecture we'll pick up with Andrew Jackson and Jacksonian democracy.